uh, folks in the National Park Service today. So uh, it's just it's just fun to be here. Um, So today I'm going to give uh, a presentation called The Race to the Dam, A Resilience Theory Perspective. So I am the author of To the End of the World, Nathaniel Green, Charles Corn Wallace, and The Race to the Dam. So um, that's my most recent book. I'm also <laughs> the author of a book called The Quaker and the Gamecock which is about Nathaniel Green's relationship with Thomas Sumter from the Great South Carolina uh, Militia General, the Gamecock. Um, we don't have that book here today, but you can certainly get it on Amazon. Um, I was born in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I attend the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. I got a master's degree from um, UNC Greensboro, and I'm currently working on a PhD in natural resource policy at Clemson University. And this ties into my career. For most of my career, I've been working in land conservation. I've been working for land trusts here in the Carolinas. I've worked at three different um, land trusts during the course of my conservation career. Oh, and, and then even though I write history, I love history, I am not academically trained as a historian. So I consider myself an amateur historian. I'm just someone who loves history and likes to write about it. So um, before I get into this crazy kind of resiliency theory stuff, I just wanted to give you an outline of what I, what I talk about in the book um, and kind of this period of the American Revolution um, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the book really opens on August 16th, which is when Cornwallis defeats Horatio Gates at the Battle of Camden, South Carolina. Probably uh, Cornwallis' greatest victory of the war and, and, and humiliation for Gates. Gates flees from the battlefield. Um, after Camden, Cornwallis is getting ready. He's preparing to launch this invasion of North Carolina. So this is a part of the American Revolution that historians have come to call the Southern Strategy. And um, in 1780, the British were really desperate to figure some way to kind of wrap up the war. They'd been fighting for six years. The war had become very expensive. It had become unpopular at home. Now they were fighting France and Spain as part of this effort. And they were, they were really desperate to figure something out, figure some way to, to wrap this thing up. And part of the strategy was that they had been led to believe that in the South, there was um, this silent majority of loyalists. And so if, they, if the British could come to the South, which they, which they had pretty much ignored for most of the war, and establish military control, then all of these loyalists would come out of the woodworks and they would reestablish loyalist governments of these southern colonies. And by doing this, they were hoping to provoke George Washington down from the north into some kind of decisive conflict. And so they had a lot of success with this strategy in South Carolina after the capture of Charleston in May 1780. And North Carolina was kind of the next rung on the ladder. They were going to move into North Carolina, attempt to do the same thing there, and then if that was successful, attempt to do the same thing in Virginia. Virginia was really kind of the key to it because they figured that if they got to Virginia with all of the rest of the South under their control, then Washington would be forced to come down and try to fight um, the British. Uh, and, and that would be a, what they needed to, to, to win the war, to bring the war resolution. So um, in December 2nd, 1780, Nathaniel Green, the Continental General, comes down and, and he replaces Horatio Gates, who had been humiliated at Camden. Um, on January 17th, um, part of Green's force under Daniel Morgan fights the Battle of Calpens, which is, of course, where, we're, where we are today. And we're not really going to go into too much detail about Calpens, but you can certainly read all about it in the book. Um, on February 1st, there's a battle at a place called Calpens Ford on the Catawba River. Um, the Americans are retreating across North Carolina. On February 3rd, they escape across the Yadkin River with the British in close pursuit, kind of pulling up to the southern bank of the Yadkin River just as the Americans are unloading on the northern bank. 
And again, essentially the same thing happens on February 14th, where the Americans similarly are able to escape across the Dan River with the British in close pursuit. And at that point, the British kind of give up and they go back to Hillsborough, North Carolina, and they try to set up this loyalist government, which they're not very successful in doing. So this is a map of that timeline that we just reviewed. Here's Green and Charlotte. Here's Calpens, and here's Green's retreat, Green and Morgan's retreat across North Carolina. And if you read kind of conventional history of the American Revolution, then you, usually the race to the Dan is just referred to as this last part of the retreat, kind of the part of the retreat where the Americans are escaping from Guilford Courthouse up across the Dan River with Cornwallis close pursuit, but I really wanted to expand the story, kind of expand the horizon of the race to the Dan. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this is I felt like Green, Nathaniel Green, looked at the Carolinas in a way that was kind of similar to the way that, that I, as a conservationist, would study this region. And in land conservation, we're really focused on river corridors. We're always looking at maps of river corridors. And trying to figure out ways that we can put chunks of uh, conserved land together to create those nice riparian buffers that filter out so much of the pollution that's in our system. They're great for wild, wildlife um, migratory corridors, wildlife moves up and down these corridors. So, so we're always studying river corridors from kind of a strategic perspective. And Green wasn't looking at the river corridors of the Carolinas from that perspective, but he was studying them very strategically. And even before he gets down to, to Charlotte, North Carolina in, in early December 1780, he's sending out survey teams. So he sent out teams to survey the, the Atkin River, the Catawba River, and then the Dan River, which is a, a tributary of the Roanoke River. So, Green's not looking at parcels of land, obviously, but he's looking at ways to use these rivers as part of a continental transportation system. Because the road system in, in the Carolinas was notoriously bad at this point in time. There, it wasn't very well mapped. There were all kinds of private roads. Um, when, when it rained, the roads turned to mud, and you couldn't really use them for wagons or transporting goods or large amounts of people. So Green was trying to figure out a way to use these rivers as part of his transportation system. And so what he did was he sent these survey teams out and they were documenting everything they could about the river. And so one of the things they were documenting was where the rivers could be forded because that was primarily how you crossed the river in the 18th century. You had to walk or ride your horse across it. And he was also collecting information about how the rivers behaved. So he would he would have these teams ask people in the community, well, how, how soon after a heavy rain will the, will, the river be, will the river subside enough so it can be forded again? He was collecting information about how long it takes to march between these ford, fords or crossing places. So how many days it would take, or how many, how many days it would take to get from the trading ford on the Yankton River to a place like Cowan's Ford. He was even inventorying all the boats that they could find at, this, at these places. So he's keeping track of how many boats were available at these places. And so part of the reason why I wanted to tell this story was I, I felt kind of an affiliation with Green because he was, he was studying these river systems. And these, those four river basins, or these three river basins, and then the broad basin where we are today, I worked in conservation in in three of those four basins. I actually worked, my first job was at the Catawba Lands Conservancy in Charlotte, then I worked on the Yadkin River, and then most recently I've been working in Spartanburg on conserving the Broad River. So that's one of the reasons that I decided to tell the story the way that I did in the book. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little, just a little bit about uh, resilience here. We're going to stay at a pretty high level. But before we talk about resilience theory, we really have to talk about equilibrium theory. And equilibrium theory comes out kind of a, comes from kind of an earlier era of ecological thought 
where we believed that if we if, if ecosystems kind of were just left to operate on their own, they would kind of self-organize around maximum efficiency. They would operate at this climax state kind of where inputs equals outputs and hopefully you may recognize this diagram as the demand, supply equals demand diagram. And those two concepts, economy and ecology, had a lot of overlap, particularly in the early days of ecology. And, and humans being humans, we've, we've decided that we can extend that concept to our own management of ecosystems. So we can manage ecosystems around this equilibrium. Um, and one of the examples I like to use or talk about here in the southeast are these loblolly pine plantations that we see just driving down the highway. Now, to some people, these may look like kind of like you know normal functioning forest ecosystems, but in fact, they're monocultures where the entire ecosystem is organized around pine production. And so, eco resilience theory, or sometimes you hear it called ecological resilience theory. Is, is in contrast to equilibrium theory. And in, in resilience theory, we say that ecosystems aren't organized kind of around this climax state, around this equilibrium state. They're actually constantly in flux, and they're constantly changing. And as the different actors in the ecosystem consume more and more of the resources in that system, they're becoming less and less stable. So we have two central themes in resilience theory. One is this idea of adaptive cycles, that systems progress through phases of organization and function. They're not inherently stable. They're inherently changing. And then we have this idea of thresholds. So in a threshold, the, the system becomes so out of balance that it begins behaving in a fundamentally different manner, often with catastrophic outcome. So using our example of the pine forest, that would be the, the introduction of the pine beetle, where there's really no kind of forces that are able to kind of counterbalance the negative force of the pine beetle. And the pine beetle is essentially able to wipe out the ecosystem to create threshold. So resilience thinking is very much systems thinking. It's looking at all the, the ways that all the different actors in a system interact and influence one another. And so, um, for the purposes of this presentation, my hypothesis is that we can compare these two different ecological models to the two different armies that were fighting um, around this part of the Carolinas uh, almost 150 years ago. And, um, So in this analogy, in this hypothesis, the British Army is very much organized around this equilibrium system. Um, I have seen some, one historian call the British Army at this time the, the, the most sophisticated bureaucracy that existed in the world at the end of the 18th century. So the British Army was highly systemized, it was highly bureaucratized. It had many different administrative um, uh, uh, structures. Um, the soldiers that fought in the British Army had very specific roles and were forced to operate under very specific conventions of war. Um, the British Army at this time was bound by social conventions and hierarchy that preserved the social caste of British society. And in fact, they were there to preserve those hierarchies, those castes. They were there to preserve the authority of King George III. Now in contrast, the British, uh, the American Army, the Continental Army was very much organized on, it, on a system of adaptation and I'm not suggesting that this was a conscious decision that, that George Washington was sitting in his headquarters saying, we've got to be more resilient, guys. He was forced 
to operate under that model. The American Army um, was organized on the fly outside of Boston in 1775. Most of its officers really had no military experience um, prior to becoming senior officers in this organization. And they were, throughout the war, they were constantly having to adapt and reorganize and be resilient. And we could even kind of carry this comparison to our two main protagonists in this part of the war, our generals, Nathaniel Green and Charles Cornwallis. Now here is Green. He was born in Potomac, Rhode Island in 1742. He was born to a um, very devout Quaker family. And uh, Green's father actually did not believe in formal education. He believed that, that anything you would need to know, you could learn in the Bible. With the exception of figures, he was a businessman. So he believed in, in, in the education on figures. But, but Green, he would not pay for Green to be educated. So Green was self-educated. He taught himself. He, he was constantly reading. He was constantly developing mentors um, and, and trying to learn um, on his own. And even at an early age, he was clearly kind of a remarkable mind. He was one of those people who could just kind of do anything you asked him to do. He could lead your troops in battle. He could organize your supply system. He could just kind of do it all. He just was one of those lucky human beings that was just really good at whatever he set out to do. And Washington recognizes this talent, this intellect in Green, pretty quickly. And Green actually becomes one of Washington's um, favorite officers, even to the point where people said Green was like a son to Washington. Uh, and the other officers got would be jealous of Green's special relationship with Washington. Now, Green was so talented that Washington had actually made him um, the quartermaster general earlier in the war, which was the supply officer. And Green hated this assignment, but even he probably would admit that he was pretty, pretty good at it. Um, he just, he had a mind that could just kind of organize and, and, and administer things. But he was really unhappy doing this. And when Gates is humiliated at Camden, Washington is able to move Green into command of what they call the Southern Department. This was all the Continental soldiers in the South, as well as the militia that were fighting with the Continental soldiers. So Green, in 1780, at the opening of our story, Green, this is his first independent command of the war. Really the first time he's operating away from George Washington. And I write in the book about how Green was really schooled in empiricism. Um, this was the Enlightenment. Um, this was a period of intellect our intellectual history where we really believed um, that kind of uh, the crown, the church, these, these organizations that had traditionally controlled knowledge and said what was right and what was wrong and what we could and couldn't do. Um, that authority was beginning to, to disintegrate, and we were beginning to think that, that we could use our own intellect to, to figure things out. We didn't need the crown or the church telling us what was right and what was wrong. Green was very much a part of this intellectual tradition. Now, in contrast, we have Charles Cornwallis, uh, born in 1738, so he really wasn't that much older than the theme of Green, just about four years older than the theme but from an entirely different universe. Um, so Cornwallis, in 1762, he inherited the title of Earl from his father, who died that year. And this makes Charles Cornwallis a peer of the realm. So he's at the very highest echelon of British society and British aristocracy. There's about 200 people in England that are peers of the realm. They're, they're the closest you can get to the crown without being a king. Um, he was considered the British Army's best fighting general, but he had a tendency to kind of check out when things don't go his way. And I'll talk about this that part of Cornwallis today, but I do talk about it in the book. Um, 
And so he was very much invested in this hierarchical system of the British Army. If the British Army was bound by social conventions and hierarchy that, that were designed to preserve the social caste of British society, Cornwallis was at the top of that heap. And so he was very invested in maintaining those tasks, maintaining those hierarchies, maintaining those conventions. Um, and here's a quote from the book, the British officer who dared to confront the bureaucracy or conventions of the British Army not only threatened his military career, but also his societal position. Certainly, Cornwallis had no incentive to do 